I've been very impressed with Josh right from the start. I just want to give you a little bit of background uh, on him before we, before we turn it over to him to talk. Oh, and uh, Daniel asked me to also mention that this is the second of three talks um, about allocation. Um, and the, the next one is Jim Martin, is that right? Um, that we'll be talking about allocation in the Lower Columbia River. So, um, so Josh uh, has kind of a um, strange life history uh, trait for a fisheries economist um, coming from, from Texas. Um, he made the move to Seattle, which kind of makes sense, where he got a, a master's degree and uh, from right, right here from the University of Washington uh, in the economics department. Um, and apparently he decided not to stay because Gardner retired. So, um, moved on, moved on to uh, University of Davis, uh, UC Davis, still, still saying near the ocean. Um, but then um, got his PhD there uh, from the from the uh, Resource Econ. What, I'm not sure what the name of that department is now. Is it? Ag and Resource. Uh, and, uh, and then strangely, um, despite his continued interest in fisheries economics, moved on to uh, University of Ari or Arizona State University uh, in Phoenix um, at the School of Sustainability. Now, how can I get this? Let's see. There we go. So um, he has, though, continued to, to uh, stay interested in commercial uh, commercial fisheries economics, um, uh, not not his sole interest, but uh, seems to be a, a primary one, despite the fact that there are not a lot of fisheries in the desert there. Um, I think he's still mostly work, looking at fisheries in Alaska, um, but he's been doing a variety of work on uh, um, and uh, effects on uh, of IFQs on crew, economics of managing bycatch, uh, and, and a variety of other things. And he's really really made a mark. Uh, in the in the fisheries economics uh, community, um, but he's also been uh, uh, working on recreational economics and recreational fisheries economics, which is something that uh, not so many people uh, are, are are doing, both commercial and, and recreational, um, and I think gives him some real insights um, that are useful and and perhaps the reason why he's brought uh, was brought to give this talk today, um, and in, in addition to that. Um, he also uh, has a whole, whole other uh, academic life uh, associated with urban and land use economics and has done some really interesting work there, um, including looking at the, the using hedonic modeling, price modeling to look at the, the value of being near, near the water, uh, which is generally positive, but maybe not always <laughs> positive. <laughs> so uh, with, uh, with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Josh. We won't take up any more of his time. And let me give you the microphone. Let's find your uh, presentation here. There we go. All right. I'll get started. At least two. I'm going to hope that that's going to hold there. Let's see. No pocket. All right. So I'm realizing I'm drifting out of the space here. So uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you very much for having me. It's really all, it's always nice to revisit my old stomping grounds here and see see lots of uh, old friends and people that I, I still work and see on a regular basis. Um, I just I realized as I was watching um, previous week speaker Brad Gentner come and speak that you're literally listening to two guys with beards from Arizona in subsequent weeks lecture you on, fish, on recreational fisheries. And that just seems like a really improbable event, but here it is, okay? Stranger things have happened. So the title of my presentation here is Last Things First, The Folly of Recreational Commercial Allocation Policy. And the context for this and sort of the overall context for this uh, slice of this series are the battles of allocation, and I think calling them battles is not really an overstatement, um, that are brewing, um, currently existing in some fisheries and actually um, very likely to occur in a number of others in, in coming years. Um, it certainly seems like disputes between recreational and commercial fisheries and the um, allocations 
of fish between them has become more and more pressing in recent years. Um, I was recently talking to a colleague that works at NOAA headquarters and also in South Atlantic, Mid-Atlantic fisheries, and he gave me a list of six or seven different fisheries that just in those sort of regions seem to be uh, very quickly heading towards uh, allocation, you know, disputes over allocation and adjudication. And so what are some possible drivers for this? Well, for one, one possibility in certain areas, although certainly not overall, it's not really overall the case that demand for recreational fishing is growing, but in certain areas you have enough population growth that it's effectively, in spite of the fact that per capita, you know, uh, demand for recreational fishing may be relatively stable or even declining a bit. If you're living in an area like the South where population is increasing um, quite dramatically in recent years, then nevertheless total demand can go up. Under rebuilding plans and, uh, and, ask, and um, under increased legal pressure under those rebuilding plans to really strictly enforce quotas, there's just fewer fish to go around in many, many settings and um, we're you know, strictly enforcing catch limits more, more and more. And so there's effectively fewer fish to work with, and that might be a driver in some cases. And another interesting phenomenon is that in many cases, these allocation disputes are ongoing in fisheries where you have a commercial sector that has undergone some sort of catch share management. And that tends to consolidate the, the commercial fleet, make things more valuable in that fleet, and therefore, as a result, you might have a greater demand for quota. That quota now has higher value in the commercial sector than it had before. And so there's now a bit more room for contention. The commercial sector now wants more quota in an environment where there's actually positive profits to, to be had from commercial fishing. And so the case study that I'm going to talk about mostly, mostly contain myself within today is the Gulf of Mexico red snapper fishery. This is the fishery I can uh, speak with the most um, have the most experience on. And this is a very long-lived, slow-growing reef, spe reef species. These are living like 30 years. Um, they're managed under the Gulf of Mexico Reef Fish FMP. And as of 1990, at 1988, the stock was actually very heavily overfished. And they were actually overfishing at that time, too. Um, and as you can see from sort of the trend here, this is spawning potential, spawning potential ratio. You know, things were, you know, we, we were down below 5% spawning potential ratio relative to an unfished stock. And what occurred shortly after this rebuilding plan got going in 1990 was something called Amendment 1. And this effectively allocated the TAC between recreational and commercial 51-49. And so most of this talk, I'll just say 50-50, okay? But effectively, 51% commercial, I'm sorry, 51% rec, 49% commercial. And so effectively, 50-50 split. Um, Brad last week said that the stock is rebuilt. We're actually, the rebuilding target is here, here at about 26% spawning potential ratio. We're nowhere near there yet. There's actually a lot of fish in the water, but those fish are young. They're not very reproductive. and so. In terms of the age structure, things are still a long way from being rebuilt, even though there's a lot of fish in the sea. Okay. So, in terms of the management history of this fishery, um, effectively what you had was a, a limited access system in the commercial sector as of the early 90s. And then in 2007, an IFQ program for Red Snapper went into place. And so they established uh, you know, secure rights to you know, shares of the catch, and these are now traded among fishermen. And so what that has created is a year-round fishery in the commercial fishery that did not exist previously. You had season lengths before. And what you're looking here is the number of season, um, the number of days that the federal season is open and they're now fishing a 365-day season. What has occurred concurrently with all this innovation in the, on the commercial side is a open access recreational fishery. There's no limit on the number of participants in the recreational fishery. Um, and the way that this fishery has been traditionally managed is through a combination of season limits, which are projected ahead of time to try to keep catch within the TAC. Um, 
and bag limits. And so this sort of combination of season, length, season length restrictions and bag limits has been what has regulated this fishery. Now what has happened over time is you see that, you know, we started out with seven fish per angler day on the bag limit. We're now to a place where you only have two fish per, per angler day. Um, and this is even as the stock has grown, and this is sort of part of the rebuilding plan, but it's also been, um, you see this combination of declining bag limits and shorter and shorter seasons. And this is in part because of the success of rebuilding. It's become easier and easier to catch fish, and so you have to, in essence, constrain bag limits more, make the season shorter, because there's just effort is so effective in the recreational sector now compared to what it used to be. But there's also the fact that this is just open access, and as, stock, as stocks have gone up, more and more people want to go snapper fishing. And, um, and so effort really has run away. The number of angler days you know, in a given period has actually gone up quite dramatically. And this year, we actually had the shortest season in history for this fishery. It was nine days starting on June 1st. Um, they thought that the year before, where the season closed before July 4th, starting at June 1st, they thought that was the worst ever. And then we had a nine-day season, which was driven in part by these uh, state non-compliance issues, states effectively allowing fishing outside of the federal seasons for this same stock. And then the feds had to compensate by setting the federal season even shorter to try to stay within the TAC. That's what you effectively see going here, is what happens when five states all decide at the same time to fish out of compliance with the federal season. You get a nine-day season. So if you look at the differences between annual landings and quotas by sector, this is sort of looking at how have landings compared to the actual quota. And if you look at the, com the commercial sector, that's what you see here in orange, and the deviations are relatively small. Ignore 2010, because what happened in 2010 in the Gulf of Mexico? There was this minor thing called an oil spill then, okay, here. And so no one caught all their quota in 2010. But aside from that, the thing to notice is the height of all these blue bars. And what you see is regular overages of, you know, one, two, three million pounds in the recreational sector. Keep in mind that over this time, so say in 2012, I believe the allocation was around 9 million pounds, the total TAC. So take 50% of that, you know, 4.5 million pounds was what roughly the recreational sector had, and they caught 3 million over that, okay? So really, really big overages relative to the actual tax. So the true allocation of fish is very different from the regulated allocation of fish. Now, if you look at the proportions of landings by sector relative to the formal allocation, the formal allocation of fish is here in black. And so what you can see uh, with the you know, exception of the oil spill year is you know, very big um, overages of the effective allocation that went to recreational fishing relative to what they were formally allocated. And so this is the context that we're dealing with in the Gulf of Mexico. However, so far I've talked about sort of two sectors, recreational and commercial, but that's actually oversimplifying things a bit. The, commercial, the, the recreational sector, in fact, is really comprised of two or three subsectors, depending upon how you think about it. There are private anglers who are out there going on their own boats, fishing from piers, things like that. And then there's actually the four higher sector, uh, which consists of head boats, which are boats that can take more than six passengers, and then charter vessels, which take six or fewer. And the dark blue here is the four higher sector. And what you see, particularly in recent years, is the erosion of the proportion of annual landings that is caught by the four higher sector relative to the private anglers. And what's going on here are a couple of things. For one, there's a limited entry program for the four higher sectors. So charter and headboats are under limited entry. That sector can't get any bigger than what it is. Simultaneously, you have shorter and shorter seasons, and more and more private anglers packing themselves into those seasons. And 
the head boats are effectively, you know, the four higher sectors effectively capacity constrained within these short seasons, and so their share is going down. And in fact, it's becoming very hard to make a living if you're a four higher fisherman, you know, in a month season or particularly a nine day season for red snapper. And so this is what's going on in terms of the allocation. You see more and more fish caught by the recreational sector, and within that sector, more and more of that going to the private recreational angler. So Amendment 28 then came about in this, um, the intent of Amendment 28 in the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council was to revisit allocations. And this was strongly urged by the recreational sector. Um, but there are some other reasons for considering it as well. And the idea was to revisit allocations to A, these were the stated purposes in, this, in the amendment, increase net benefits from red snapper fishing. So there's economic language here, okay, that's being used. And to increase the stability of recreational seasons. So by allocating more fish to recreational anglers, we will get longer seasons. And we'll, uh, the presumption is that we will get more stability and we will reverse this trend towards shorter and shorter seasons that we've observed. And if you, um, if you look at the regulatory analysis that was done for this and the sort of economic analysis that was done for it, it was actually justified by some analysis done by some NIMS Southeast Fisheries Science Center economists. And this SESSC, that, so in the Southeast, they have a socioeconomic um, scientific and statistical council, a committee, and, um, and they said this was the best available economic science. And, and the preferred alternative, uh, there was a whole slew of alternatives, I can remember at least nine, um, but the preferred alternative was to say, if quota was less than 9.12 million pounds, which was the maximum that had ever been harvested up to that point, then 51% would go to commercial and 49% to rec. Okay, so that's the historical split between these two fisheries, I mean, between these two sectors. But if anything beyond 9.12 um, occurred, so if there was any more tack than that, then you would split any of that surplus 75-25 between recreational and commercial. So any, any future growth in the fish stock is going to be split 75%, 25% between recreational and commercial. Okay? And at 11 million pounds, which is where uh, last year's quota roughly, that means a 53-46 split roughly to the decimal point. Okay? And so we're not talking about massive changes here. We're talking about an extra couple of percentage to recreation and the idea that this will increase season leads. And before I dive into sort of the depth of my argument, I kind of wanted to just point out the sort of context in which economic arguments were used in the council process and sort of the way that they uh, entered into the argument. And so what I've done here is I've put basically one side against the other. So in one corner you have the Coastal Conservation Association, a very much pro-recreational group funded by recreational anglers. And then you have Share of the Gulf, which is a commercial funded entity, and I don't think it's any secret, EDF does have a fair role in organizing and funding this, okay? So you have two different interest groups that are certainly aligned with one side or another. And what you have coming from the CCA is until a consistent allocation review formula is developed and employed regularly, this process is still subject to manipulation by politics and emotion. Economics provides one of the few objective criteria to evaluate fishery allocations that deliver greatest benefits to the nation. So you have an, you know, an a, um, industry group actually saying we should use economics to avoid the politics. Now this industry group happened to have their position supported by this economic analysis. Okay, if the shoe were on the other foot. I don't know what their press release would have said, but. And then they said, economics should be one of the key factors taken into account, set, setting forward-looking allocations. And the SESSC shows the economic benefits to the nation increase as red snapper quota is shifted to the recreational sector. Okay, so that's what's been said here. Um, now, because the recreational sector claimed net benefits as being in their favor, 
you had to have another economic argument to support the commercial industry. And so what did they come up with? Well, okay, sorry, I forgot. There was one other thing that the recreational sector talked about, which was the total, benef total economic benefits that occur because of recreational fishing versus commercial fishing. And let's just say the blue area is recreation, okay? Private recreation. That little purple sliver there is the net present value, the discounted value of all future profits from the commercial sector, okay? And so the argument was, look at us, we're bigger. We have more economic value in total. So you should, that means you should give us more quota. Now, of course, if you think about this for just a second, you would say, well, wait a second. Just because you generate more total economic value doesn't mean that if we give you more fish that you will generate more economic value than the other sector, okay? Doesn't follow from a comparison of total values that the value of changing the allocation would actually follow that pattern, okay? And so this is fallacious and definitely not what was intended by Wade Griffin and Rich Woodward, who are very competent economists when they put out this report, okay? Now, what does the commercial sector come up with? Well, they came up with food security, okay? That Red Snapper is providing local, sustainable seafood. The problem with it is that most of the seafood that is, most of the red snapper doesn't really stay in the Gulf of Mexico. Most of it gets shipped out and it sells for a very nice high price. But when all is said and done, it basically substitutes really well for Chilean sea bass, for halibut, for any number of non-salmon fish that you could think about, okay? Most Americans just don't, they substitute really readily between these things. And so the sort of idea that we're providing protein for America at $30 a pound, this is the sale price, um, is not the strongest economic argument, let's just say, okay? And so there's arguments being made on both sides of this. Here's my argument. First, you know, Economic al analyses rightly focus on achieving economic efficiency, on this thing called net benefits that Brad talked to you about um, last week. And for that, we rely a lot on something called the equal marginal principle, which I'm going to talk about um, in some detail today. Um, and when we engage in these sort of ec uh, economic analyses, traditionally how we think about it is, let's move a little quota around, but let's keep all the other management institutions fixed. And then let's see, do we improve net benefits in doing so? Now, my argument here is that much of this work that has relied on this sort of way of thinking is really deeply flawed in its conception of efficiency. And I'll make that much more clear in a second. But I feel like effectively it's measuring the wrong thing. It's a very well specified thing theoretically, but it doesn't relate to the actual world we're looking at. And frankly, if you care about efficiency, if you care about maximizing net benefits, then you might want to care a lot about what's going on in an open access fishery that catches 50% of the fish, or actually is catching way more than 50% of the fish, but if they were staying under their TAC, would catch 50% of the fish. You know, if we really care about efficiency, we care about it generally, not just in the allocation between commercial and recreational, we should also care about it inside individual sectors, okay? And what I would argue is that if you are thinking from this perspective and, and from a perspective of accountability and staying within TACs, and also from a perspective of fairness, I would argue that intersector, these cross-sector allocation issues are rarely a first-order issue. Um, they may be very important political issues, but from an objective management perspective, I would argue that they're very often a red herring. And if you know the etymology of a red herring, it's actually you know, a smoked herring. And the idea of a smoked herring was it was actually used to train hunting dogs. The scent was so powerful that it could, you know, they could use this to try to pull them off the main scent. Okay? And so a red herring, that's sort of the etymology of where a red herring comes from. And so number three, I would argue that policy would actually be better served if we would focus 
on informing managers on how to achieve efficiency, so yes, efficiency, accountability, and fairness within and between sectors. And I'll talk about a, a trajectory of policy reform that I think would get us there much more effectively than this obsession with intersector allocation. So what do I, so I talked about accountability and efficiency and fairness. Let me just start by saying I'm going to talk about accountability and efficiency and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about fairness in really formal terms because frankly I think it's hard to talk about fairness in formal terms in a way that everyone will agree with, okay? Really depends on where you find yourself in the bargain, how you think about fairness, right? Um, however, I will say that one criterion about fairness that I think we could probably all agree on is that if you are in, existing in a system where you have a de facto right to something, so whether it's a formal right or through management in action, over years and years you effectively have gab gotten access to the resource, one aspect of fairness is to have that right respected and potentially be compensated for it, okay, if the right is taken away from you. That doesn't, as Brad indicated, mean that I say you always need a market, okay? Um, markets would be one way to achieve that. I think there's a lot of great reasons why it would, we should want them. But look, we do things like eminent domain all the time where we respect property owners' rights. We compensate them, but we're not exactly offering them a you know, a trade, we're saying, take the money, we're taking your land, okay? But there's still a respecting of the right that's involved in that, in that arrangement. Now, accountability, what do I mean by accountability? Well, ideally for fishing mortality itself, that's really the, the input that's at play here, is fishing mortality. In reality, we're often very much restrained to looking at landings. It could be a big problem for a deep water reef fish like red snapper. Okay. Now, serious strides in accountability have been made in many commercial fisheries, I would say. We're increasingly, particularly in the U.S. and some other um, developed countries, move pretty strongly towards accountability for catch. Um, and, but having said that, recreational fisheries present some very special accountability challenges. And, these include the fact that you have a very large and diffuse population of anglers. You just, frankly, you know, the number of players is much harder to define, and there's just more of them, okay? It's hard to define even who this population is, okay? Um, there's very pretty, I mean, pretty poor control of total fishing mortality by bag and size limits, the traditional management tools of recreational fisheries. Over and over again, very prominent fishery scientists like Carl Walters have talked about how these bag and size limits just don't constrain total fishing mortality in any meaningful way. And there's very limited and lagged catch monitoring. It's really hard when you have hundreds of ports and thousands and thousands of anglers to you know, actually have catch monitoring, particularly at the individual level. And it's very difficult to estimate mortality from discarded catch from a bunch of uh, recreational anglers as well. So these are all big challenges. However, when I talk about accountability, I'm not talking about accountability at this level of the individual angler. I don't think that we need a system that gets it 100% right for every person. We need accountability at the level of the sector, okay? Now, I think there's reasons to create incentives at the level of the individual angler. That does, that's not the same as you know, 100% catch monitoring of recreational anglers, that's a silly thing in almost all contexts, okay? But I want to be really clear, in a world where you have a very accountable commercial sector where they are kept within their TAC and a recreational sector where for every fish they, for every fish that you reallocate from commercial, they catch 1.3, 1.4 fish in the recreational sector, this fiction of a one-for-one -one movement of fish is a fiction. You really need to be thinking about moving, you know, a fish and a half or, you know, a fish and a quarter for every fish you take out of commercial, okay? And so the accountability matters not just for the um, sort of socioeconomics of it, it matters for managing fishing mortality. What do I mean by efficiency? And I think this is something that, um, particularly for a crowd of non-economists, is really important to define and why do we care about this so much as economists? 
And the basic idea is this is defined as an efficient outcome is one that maximizes benefits net of costs. And that makes a lot of sense in a corporate sort of context where you're looking at profits, you're looking at revenues minus cost. It makes sense that you would want, if you're running a corporation, that you would like to maximize um, that, that difference. If you're thinking about this from the perspective of society as a whole, or between recreational and commercial anglers, you really are looking at a setting of <coughs> excuse me, maximizing the total benefits to consumers, which you could think about as the monetary value they would give over for being able to have those fish, okay, what they'd be willing to pay for that number of fish, minus their expenditures, what they actually paid for it. Okay, and so that surplus, what is left over, is with benefits to recreational anglers, broadly speaking. And then we would add that to the benefits that go to the commercial sector, and we want to maximize the sum of these things if we're going to think about everyone's dollar of net benefits being treated equally in this setting. Okay? And we could also include non-market benefits, sort of the value you know, from people that don't even fish, that just the value that they have from knowing that there are red snapper in the water as well, if we could get a handle on such a thing. Okay? And there's lots of work in non-market valuation economics trying to look at these sort of existence values, for example. But efficiency more broadly could be parsed into two major components. We can think about the within sector part of efficiency, which is maximizing within the sector, so within commercial or within recreational, the net benefits conditional on that sector's allocation of fishing mortality. So given how many fish they have, let's make the most of it basically. And then we can think about between sector efficiency, which is maximizing total net benefits through the allocation of fishing mortality across sectors. Okay? And so you could think about between sector efficiency without thinking about the efficiency within the sector. Okay? Or you could think about within sector efficiency without thinking about efficiency of allocation between. But if you really want to think about efficiency together, globally, you need to be thinking about both of these aspects. Okay? So how do we measure within sector efficiency? Well, the key insight here is that fish, regardless of whether they go to commercial fishermen or whether they go to recreational fishermen, they're inputs. They don't, they're not valued in and of themselves. They're valued either in creating fish fillets for the market, for example, or in creating a much more nebulous, but nevertheless, you know, real thing, which is the recreational experience, a service that's provided by the environment, okay? In combination with your fishing pole and the fuel in the boat and all that, okay? And so while I would agree with, you know, our, our previous speaker that recreation is different and the type of good that's being produced is a lot more complicated in some ways, at the end of the day, fish are inputs, and we should be looking at their value going into one kind of, you know, going into making fish fillets or going into producing uh, valuable recreational experiences. And the benefit granted by an additional fish to either sector is reflected in its demand curve. It's, economists will call this an input demand curve. It's the value, um, the willingness to pay for one more fish, okay? And there's a whole schedule here of what that looks like. I'll show you in a second. And so basically, if you were to answer the question as a recreational angler, what's the maximum amount you're willing to pay for one more fish? That's effectively the kind of value we're thinking about here. And that's a value that's comparable in a way to the way that a commercial fisherman would say, how much am I willing to pay to get one more fish on the deck, given what I know I can sell it for, et cetera. Okay. Now, economists have many methods to try to estimate these demands, and that is not what I want to talk about today. You could easily get lost in all the methodological details. And my critiques have nothing to do with the statistical details whatsoever. I'm willing to concede that all of the analyses going into this are perfectly executed econometrically, okay? Even if so, all the critiques that I'm going to have apply. And so what is this, what is, uh, well, what does this demand curve for fish look like for a recreational fisherman? And so on the x-axis, we have recreational landings. On the y-axis, we have marginal benefits, the dollar per fish. So just think about this as how much you're willing to pay for one more fish, okay? 
And let's suppose that we're in a world where we have three different anglers. So let's keep the world really simple. I'm an economist. I like that. Okay? So our first demand curve here is really low. So this person really doesn't, isn't willing to spend much for fish. And very quickly, their willingness to pay goes to zero for a very small number of fish. Okay? So they'll pay for the, a little bit for the first one, and then this, you know, their demand tapers off really quickly. Fisherman number two is willing to, you know, they like catching fish a little bit more than fisherman one, and, you know, they, be, they have a positive willingness to pay for a fish up to a little bit more. And then we have a third angler here, which, is, which has even a stronger demand. So the, the last uh, line that went up there is for someone that has a stronger demand for fish as an input to the recreational, pro, um, the recreational fishing process. So you could think about these as be people that all like fishing. They may be, all be equally avid fishermen. But this person may really value cat, you know, retaining fish. This person may just be very happy to catch them and throw them away. That's one way you could think about this. Okay. Now, if we were to then take a particular price, you know, a particular value, and then see how much how many fish would be caught at that value? Well, then, you know, person two and person three would catch 10 and 15, respectively. Which means that if you were to charge, you know, the, the, this price, the total number of fish that would actually be caught would be 25. Okay? And so if you were to repeat this and ch choose lots of different prices and engage in the same sort of addition, you get a demand curve that looks like this, and it has these funny kinks in it because of these places where different fishermen are coming in. Okay? And this curve is basically what we think about when, we're talk when, um, when we talk about marginal benefits and um, the value of a fish in recreation. Okay? We're effectively talking about this demand curve, in essence, across all anglers. And so in reality, we're doing this over hundreds of thousands of people. Okay. So that's the total demand of the recreational sector. And this area in red up to 25, okay, the area in red is all, if you were to add up all of those marginal benefits, all those in benefits for a little bit, basically if you were to integrate or add up all the area underneath that, you would get the total benefits that come from getting 25 fish. So this is sort of the total amount that these three anglers would be willing to pay to get these 25 fish. Okay? So that's what we mean by total benefits. Now, how do we get to net benefits? So suppose that our total quota is here. Okay? And you can think about all of the quota either going to recreational landings or you can think about yourself, putting yourself on the other side of the graph and looking this way and think about as you move back in my direction, you're, at, you're taking fish away from recreation and putting it towards commercial. And so we can divide up the, the total amount of fish between recreational and commercial. And in fact, if you think about it that way, as you get more commercial fish this way, there's actually a demand curve on the commercial side, which you could think about as, for example, the the demand curve for um, leasing quota in an ITQ fishery, for example, which would look like this, okay? And this is showing you how much the commercial sector is willing to pay for a little bit more fish from starting at having no fish, so they're willing to pay a lot for the first fish, and as you add more and more fish into the commercial sector and take away from the recreational sector, their value is declining, okay? So the, the commercial sector's got the same declining uh, relationship as the recreational. So what do we mean by net benefits? Well, take the area in red for a particular allocation level. So suppose we allocate this much to recreation and then all of the rest goes to commercial. So that's a very commercial heavy allocation. Well, that would be the total benefits to the recreational sector of that allocation. Well, what would be the cost to the commercial sector? 
it would be the, the foregone benefits, the benefits they didn't get by not getting to have that part of the allocation. This part of, this part of the allocation is going to recreation, and as a result, commercial doesn't get the blue area. And so if you're thinking in terms of net benefits, the red minus the blue is what you would call the net. Okay, so it's the area between the two curves. And if you wanted to allocate efficiently, so economists would say, well, how do you maximize net benefits? How do you get to this place of, this happy place of, of allocating to maximum um, net benefits? Well, you would keep going um, until the red line and the blue line cross, till marginal benefits to recreation equal the marginal benefits to commercial. So that the willingness to pay for one more fish is the same, regardless of whether it goes to commercial or whether it goes to recreational. Okay, that's the traditional story that we call the equal marginal principle, because the marginal benefits are equal. Okay? And in this particular case, you would allocate this much to commercial, this much to recreation in this story. Okay, well, here's the way it actually works. That's the ideal. Here's how it actually works. The reality is that data is spotty. We don't observe lots of different um, allocation um, levels across fisheries. We have limited data, limited time series variation. And so what we end up with quite often are a couple of point estimates that say, well, we think the marginal benefit is somewhere in this fuzzy range for recreational and somewhere here in this blue area for commercial. And if you look at this, you think, well, Benefits are higher to recreational for one more fish than they are for commercial. So which way should I go? So suppose that, you know, marginal benefits to recreation are $11 and the marginal benefits to commercial are $7. Well, then one more fish seems to be more highly valued in the, which sector? Recreation. recreation. So you know that you should give more fish to recreation, right? But do you step that far? Do you allocate even more? Do you basically give everything to recreation because of this difference? Okay? And the reality is that we don't know. Okay? Very often in our analysis, we just don't have much power beyond sort of the local estimates. We can't trace out these full curves in many cases. Now, that brings me to, back to my point, which is, is intersector efficiency analysis a red herring? Okay. By the way, when is my time? Is it? Does this seminar end? Have up? Oh, geez. Okay. So, all right. So, I think it is a red herring, and here's three reasons. For one thing, the sector's demand curve conveys information not just about the valuation of fish, but it also conveys information about how you're allocating fish within the sectors. Okay? There's a specific story that is told when we draw a demand curve, which is that we are handing out the goods in the order of value, okay? Which is a story that's very consistent with the market, but it's not necessarily consistent with the way real world fisheries management institutions work. And real world fisheries institutions often choose to allocate fish very differently. In an open access setting, it's whoever can catch them first, regardless of who values the fish most highly. And fishermen that actually have this marginal valuation that were estimated by economists to have this, you know, the value that I showed you in red in the previous slide, they may have very little chance of actually catching the fish in a real world reallocation. They may not be the relevant people to be looking at. Okay? And so particularly here, if you just think about our case of 25 fish going to recreation, if you notice this, notice that 10 go to fisherman 2 and 15 go to fisherman 3, but how many does fisherman 1 get? Zero. So under this story, if we're going to allocate 25 fish, person 1 should be excluded from the fishery. Okay? Now remember, we're talking about open access fisheries. How do you exclude that person? And so what, in, what, in, what is probably true in reality in many cases is that while this may be the idealized case where we 
allocate fish to the highest value user, okay, and so that when we're at this efficient point, the idea is that only the people that had values higher than that, that market clearing price actually get fish. The reality is that regulation may allocate fish very differently. Okay? The expected valuation schedule may be very different from this idealized one. And this is based up on some of the work that Jorge Holzer and Ted McConnell did. Because of time, I'm going to whiz, whiz through this. But the basic idea is there's nothing to say that we hand out fish under open access in any way that approaches a market. We might, in fact, hand out fish randomly so that, you know, as you allocate more and more fish to recreation, it's basically a crapshoot as to the, you know, whether a high value user or a low value user gets that fish. Or we could even, in this particular case, allocate fish to the lowest valued users first, maybe unemployed people that have lots of time to fish, okay? And then as we get more and more fish and get longer and longer season lengths, for example, we get more and more fish going to the higher value users. This is, the reality is that we don't know. So some form of, some forms of catch share, like ITQs, IFQs, will tend to allocate fish efficiently um, through the sort of market transferability process that goes on in those sort of settings. But other forms of management, such as open access, really ration access in a lot, really different ways. And you know, regulation here and staying within TACs is really a process of rationing. Who do we give it to? And open access, you know, allocation in a derby season, a nine-day season, there's no reason to think that that's at all capturing the highest value users. And so a logic, an a, a analytical logic that's based upon that sort of thinking could lead us to some very misleading conclusions. Okay. We, the big point here is if we want to understand about how to allocate between sectors, we have to understand allocation that's going on within the sectors. Okay, and the allocation that's going on inside the recreational sector conditions whether it's efficient to give them more fish or not. Okay? Argument two, which is a less technical point, is that reallocation analyses are all about the current value of a fish in a particular season. They're a price at a moment. But when we talk about reallocation, we don't do it year after year after year. We don't constantly revisit this because it's a pain, right? It takes years and it's extremely contentious. Economists would say there are lots of transaction costs involved with reallocating fish, okay? And so the reality then is that we are reallocating fish for a decade or plus. So we're, we're allocating a capital asset, okay? But we're allocating it based upon a lease price, effectively. We're allocating upon the value of one more fish today, irrespective of the value of that fish tomorrow, next year, 10 years from now. And so we're effectively using the wrong kind of price to inform our allocations. So even if we are using the equal marginal principle, we're using the wrong prices usually, okay? And so allocating, you know, property rights. We're, these are de facto property rights, even if they're not property rights in law, allocating them on the basis of a snapshot metric of efficiency is not appropriate. Argument three, if we're so concerned about allocating fish efficiently, so if net benefits are the great thing that they've been claimed to be, and I think they are, then why worry exclusively about efficiency an allocation between sectors. Why not think about the efficiency gains that could come by reallocating fish inside the recreational and inside the commercial sectors? Now, we've done that a lot in the commercial sectors as we move towards cat shares, for example. But the recreational sector, we've mostly left in open access um, across all fisheries. And recreational fisheries, because they are classic derby open access fisheries, may have very, very large inefficiencies, okay? Similar to the kinds of inefficiencies we had decades ago in all the derby fisheries that we, we used to have, okay? And the other thing is, once you consider 
once you change the efficiency of, out, of management inside the recreational sector, the allocation that was justifiable before on the basis of economic efficiency will be totally different now after that management change. If you make fishing more valuable in the recreational sector, guess what? If you make fishing more efficient in the recreational sector, then it will actually support a larger allocation in the future if you, if you reform it. So I realize I'm not speaking to a bunch of converted economists here, so I want to say, you know, just sort of say, what's wrong with the status quo? Aside from the fact, uh, you know, in the recreational sector, what's wrong with the status quo? Why not just keep doing what we're doing? Now, first of all, saying, assuming we could find an accountable way of fishing under the status quo so that we could actually you know, not overfish. But assuming that, what's wrong? Well, the first thing here is, remember, fishing to recreational fishermen is an input to their, you know, the pleasure that they're getting from the recreational experience. And what you're basically telling people in an open access system is that the value of fish to you, the value of fish as an input is zero. It's cheap. Come and get it. The price is zero. Now, like anything that sells at a price of zero, you might imagine that there's a run on that resource. Okay? And so and it's no surprise then that when you send that signal to fishermen, that they respond accordingly. They show up in droves to get the free fish. That means that the demand for fish at a price of zero exceeds the regulated supply, which means somehow or another we have to get around this lie that we're telling fishermen that the price of fish is zero. So what do we do? We implement bag limits. We make seasons short. In other words, we find ways to ration supply other than price. Okay? We find some other way to hand it out. Okay? When you send a signal that the price is zero, you get too many anglers. They show up. They take more trips than they would otherwise. And they retain more of the fish than they should when they might should throw it back. Because again, the price of fishing mortality is zero in this open access context. And they invest in tackle and bait okay, in ways that make them more effective fishermen. And closures and bag limits try to close this gap, but there's problems with this. And the real problem here is that by sort of tagging on all these bag limits, season length restrictions, we're choosing to ration the resource in a particular way. But in doing so, we could be really misallocating the resource. We could be giving it to people who place a very small value on actually catching a fish. We're giving it to people in Florida that don't know the difference between a red snapper and a white grunt. Okay? But because they show up to go be, you know, to have some beach recreation in early June, they catch their regulated two bag, two bag limit for a red snapper. And so, meantime, these snowbirds here who are fishing in a special out-of-season program that was only available starting last year, these people have traditionally been walled out of fishing. And they may have a very high value of fishing, but guess what? They're not in Florida in June. They're in Florida in January. Okay? And so we've chosen to not give fish to snowbirds and give it to another group of people that are able to catch the fish in June. And that's potentially a very sizable misallocation of the resource. We could produce a lot more pleasure for fishermen by reallocating fishing differently. So. In summary here, most economic arguments employed in reallocation analyses, frankly, they, they answer a very well-specified theoretical question. It's a very well-specified question. What's the value of reallocating fish between the recreational and commercial sector, assuming both sectors allocate their fish by a market? That's the question that we're actually answering in most allocation policies. That's not the world we live in. And frankly, debates over allocation are probably masking very serious within sector challenges to efficiency and accountability and create economic wastefulness as well. And so I think in many ways, by thinking about allocation, placing so much emphasis on this, we're putting the cart before the horse, just so I can get one more colloquialism into my talk. Can we do better? So I'm going to spell out some very quick principles for reform. First, I want to say, 
Number one is we have to establish accountability for, mission, for fishing mortality in both sectors through either enforceable output or input controls. So somehow or another, we need to have accountability. And I want to be clear, I don't mean accountability in the recreational sector at the level of count, catch accounting for the individual fishermen. I mean keeping the sector within its bounds. Number two, freeze allocations according to their historical share. Let's not change allocations initially. Let's respect the de facto property rights that are in place. Let's not rock the boat. But then reform within sector management institutions. And yes, in many cases, this is going to mean thinking very carefully about the recreational sector, because in many cases, we've already done this for our commercial sector. And guess what? That low-hanging fruit is quickly going away. We're going to have to start thinking about this other 50% of the mortality in the context of Red Snapper. And then after within sector reforms have taken place and have stabilized, then I think we should deal with cross-sector allocation challenges in the new context of stable management regimes that are accountable and relatively efficient in both sectors. If possible, I would encourage transferability across sectors. I don't think that markets are the only way to deal with these transfers, but I think that one nice feature of them is that you take what used to be a zero-sum game, you win, I lose, and you turn it into one that is actually has the potential for mutual benefit. Yes, you take some of my allocation, but you paid me more than it was worth to me, okay? And so it's a win-win. If we can't have transferability, then I think that we should definitely move towards measures such as auctions or cross-sector buyouts that actually do take the party that gains and have them compensate the group that loses their property right. I think that there's, you know, in the name of fairness, I can't think of anything more fair than having your historical property right respected. Now the challenge here is the recreational sector, and I'll talk very briefly about this. Basically there's a for hire sector and there's the private anglers. I'm involved right now in some research projects looking at using co-ops much in the same way that they've been used in um, commercial fisheries in the recreational for hire sector. Honestly, I think co-ops and or even ITQ type ideas could work very well in the for hire sector. There's nothing fundamentally different about them compared to commercial. The real challenge here is private anglers. However, there are some very realistic policies that exist, but frankly, we need test cases. There's very realistic policies on paper. We haven't tried many yet, and we frankly need to start trying some. Quick couple of ideas. One idea is we could actually move towards something called harvest tags. Any hunters in the room? Okay, in many hunting systems, you know, to be able to take an elk, you have to have a tag to go with it. We could move towards a very similar system for recreation. I think there's a lot of different ways you could think about allocating those tags. One intriguing possibility is that the state could get some revenue by auctioning those off, but they're not, not necessarily auctioning them off to the private angler. They could auction them off to your Walmarts, to your bait shops. And then guess what? Walmart knows how to sell things. You know, um, They know how to allocate a resource so that there's a year-round market. And so you could gather revenue, and then you and I, if we want to go fishing, can go at the same place we get our fishing license and get our tag. Okay? And this would be one system by which you could actually place a cap on fishery landings. An alternative, which I've decided to call an angler day pass, is actually where, suppose you're in a fishery where there's a lot of fishing mortality. So landings is really not the best thing to monitor. What's really important is how many fish are you know, caught total, and discard mortality is very significant. Well, it's going to be really, really hard to ever get a handle on an individual angler's discard mortality. However, the one thing that we could do is we could monitor the next best thing. We could say, well, for everyday fishing, we know on average that anglers have this many discards and this much landings, and allocate day passes. Effectively, these are day-long day -long licenses, okay? Sort of like a bus pass, okay? And you get that validated, and they could be auctioned in the same way that I just described. Now, there could be problems with this. Maybe fishermen, because they know that they could fish all they want in that day, might really fish super-duper hard. But 
you have the ability to actually gather data. So say that you can't get another one of these passes unless you provide information, unless you fill out a form online saying what you caught. And because there's no accountability for landings or discards, but there is accountability for days, fishermen have an incentive to tell the truth about what they caught and what they discarded here, okay? And so you could then use that information to then set the total number of, of day passes in this system. And so this is one way that we could think about, again, we're not trying to get a, you know, we're trying to get accountability at the sector level here. I'm about to wrap up. There are some challenges for transferability here. Ideally, what we would like is for recreational and commercial anglers to be able to trade with each other. There's been some really nice ideas proposed. One is something called an angler management organization, an AMO. And the basic idea is that you would basically create a shareholder-owned company, which is allocated TAC. And then they sell, they are allocated the tags or the day passes. And then they are in charge of managing their fishery out of that port or out of that state. Now, there are many product, you know, policy design issues with this, many challenges. I'm not going to pretend this is a trivial solution. But the one nice thing is that once you've created an AMO like that, you've created a go between between the individual angler who is not going to find, you know, is not going to be easy to find and trade with a commercial fisherman. But you've now created an entity that can trade with the commercial industry. And so now you have a mechanism by which quota can flow in, an, in a way that is adaptive between sectors, that can change over time, that can fluctuate, and that frankly gets the councils out of the business of allocating fish. So in conclusion, economic efficiency is the proper criteria. I completely agree with your, your previous speaker um, on this. Economic efficiency is a very important criteria by which to judge allocations, along with accountability, along with um, fairness in the mechanism by which we do it. However, economist answers to effectively answer important allocation, allocation questions, the actual questions, not the ones that we can answer, um, is very limited. Um, and I, I think I differ from what was implied earlier in that that this is somehow an easy thing to fix, that we can somehow easily account for the fact that we have open access on the recreational side and we can somehow use the recreational demand models that we have to get the right demand curve. That's a research program, not a quick fix. That's not something that I or any economists that are seriously engaged in this know how to do at this point with the data in hand. Top-down reallocation without management reform is really just a temporary Band-Aid. We're talking about one or two more fishing days with the reallocations that have been discussed. This is not going to fix the recreational sector. Long-run accountability, fairness, and efficiency would be better served by realistic reforms to the within-sector management institutions, including recreation, and building institutions in each sector which will allow transferability across sectors which actually deals with some of these fairness issues and a more adaptive way of moving quota around and, and dealing with the allocation problem than what we have currently. But are we too distracted by the red herring of inter intersector allocation? Thank you. <laughs> One a bit long. Chris? Um, so I'll, I'll uh, uh, give, give Paul sort of a conal of our time here. So the distinction that you're drawing there is between the ideal true underlying demand curve for, uh, for, for recreational fish and that that we actually observe because anybody can go fishing and go fishing on any given day. Right. Isn't the way that we actually measure this to go find the people who are fishing and either give them a travel cost survey if you're doing revealed preference, or a stated preference survey if you're doing a, a hypothetical survey. So aren't we effectively capturing the demand curves um, of the people to whom we are allocating them? It depends an awful lot on the sample selection protocol by which you, you know, 
create the, tra the travel cost model, so which people are, you know, the way in which you're sampling those people in. But, uh, but I would still, I, I would grant your point to an extent. However, I think sort of an extra argument beyond what Holzer and McConnell say is that when we do a recreation demand survey, and this is getting a little bit into the weeds, we have to give fishermen a story about how they get the extra fish. Okay? And the story that's usually been used is a relaxation of the bag constraint, the bag limit. However, the way that we actually allocate these fish in the recreational sector is we are mostly holding the bag limit constant and then letting more fishermen or different fishermen fish more days at two fish a day. And those are there's no reason why those values should be the same. You know, the value of having one more fish when you've already caught two may be a very different value than the value of one more fish to someone who gets to now fish that didn't get to fish because there's now an extra day. And so is that value higher? Is it lower? I don't think we know. I'm not, I'm, I don't think that the Holzer McConnell or my arguments are arguing that this bias goes one way or another. I just think that there's a generalized um, bias that is induced by the, the management institutions and the way we frame these surveys that is not at all captured in the way that we do the allocation analysis. That's, but I think that you have a point in the sense that, you know, yeah, we are kind of sampling the people that show up, but it's going to be highly dependent on the, the sampling frame. Yeah. Right. So I think, you know, what, whether you did a day pass or a, you know, a, a harvest tag, you could think about allocating those in a lot of different ways. And one way is to think about doing it by lottery, as, as you described. From an accountability perspective and from a data provision perspective, I think that you are in great territory with the lottery. You're going to give up some efficiency. You know, people are going to get the fish that don't value it as highly as some people that don't. And so you're not going to create as much net benefit by doing so. However, there are ways that you could take the lottery and modify it. And there was a grad student at lunch, I'm trying to remember who proposed it, but a grad student actually proposed, well, why not let people buy multiple tickets for the lottery? So you could let people that want to fish more um, buy more you know, tickets for the raffle, effectively. And that would let people sort of have an intensity of preference for catching fish. But there would still be a random element, and that would create still a, a hybrid between the market and the, high, and the pure chance approach. And so I think there's a lot of creative ways to think about the allocation. And I don't think that markets are the only way. Um, I think there's some benefits you get from the extra sort of benefits of transferability. but. Um, I think the key is that we start having these discussions about how to allocate instead of talking about the wrong thing.
Right. And they might, and frankly, in a system of you know, allocating down that demand curve according to willingness to pay, they, may not, they might be left out. And so this is where you're getting into some trade-offs between efficiency and you know, other justice sort of issues. And so you could per perhaps have a set aside that is available only for the, that community if you could identify them. There would be challenges in doing so. Um, you could create some way to let them have a upweight them in the lottery in ways. They're, I think that um, you know this is not something I've thought about in great detail at this point, but I think that um, you know these are the sort of things that we've talked about. We've thought about a lot in commercial fisheries, and we've come up with all these different ways to parse out the commercial uh, allocation to meet some justice issues and get some efficiency. I think we just we need to think about how to do that in the recreational. Right. Right. And they frankly, a lot of those uh, fixed income um, retirees, they actually access the fishery resources through the for hire sector. They actually go pay to get on a charter boat, or more typically a head boat, you know, a large a party boat, because the price per trip is relatively low. For 80 bucks, you can go catch two red snappers. That's several pounds of meat for in a nice day at sea. And so that's and so in many senses their interest would be served by a secure allocation to the headboat sector, which is part of what I'm working on. Yeah, and so that's actually part of the benefit of trying as much as you can to move to, I mean, there's trade-offs here, but in a world where, you know, someone values something more highly and someone values it less so, you can at least gain if you have transferability. And so there may be people that, you know, frankly are relying on that fish protein, you know, in the current system because they have plentiful time and it's pretty cheap to get out on the water. But in a world where someone else is willing to pay $40 for the privilege of catching that fish, they might sell that out and go buy some beef. And I think that person's still having their property rights respected. And so I, they have the volition, they have the choice whether or not to fish for the red snapper or go catch the, or, or go, you know, get some beef. And so now it's a kind of a crude generalization way of putting it, but at least in that respect, you are rea yes, you're reallocating, but you are giving choice and you're giving compensation to that person that gave up the right. 